So how does the process work for a jazz soloist that improvises? Well, most of the jazz improvisation we hear takes place in the context of a tune. Now, historically, jazz musicians have favored popular American songs written between about 1920 and the mid-1950s. We often refer to the group of publishers and songwriters who dominated this period as Tin Pan Alley. We might also refer to the body of music they created as the American Songbook. The name Tin Pan Alley originally referred to a specific place in New York City, West 28th Street between 5th and 6th Avenues in Manhattan. Let's get to know in brief seven of the most celebrated Tin Pan Alley songwriters. First, there is Irving Berlin, who composed such favorites as God Bless America, White Christmas, Alexander's Ragtime Band, and There's No Business Like Show Business. Then there is the songwriting team of Richard Rogers and Lorenz Hart, who wrote Blue Moon. Spring is Here, The Lady is a Tramp, and My Funny Valentine. Jerome Kern. Jerome Kern wrote All the Things You Are, I'm Old Fashioned, and the musical Showboat, which includes such favorites as Make Believe and Old Man River. And of course, there is George Gershwin, who wrote Our Love is Here to Stay, Embraceable You, A Foggy Day, and of course the opera Porgy and Bess, which included Gershwin's most famous tune, Summertime. And let's not forget Indiana-born Cole Porter, who wrote Begin the Begin, Night and Day, Anything Goes, and I Get a Kick Out of You. And finally there is Harold Arland. Harold Arlen wrote Over the Rainbow and all of the music for the classic film The Wizard of Oz. He also wrote Stormy Weather, That Old Black Magic, and Blues in the Night. These are just seven of the most famous names of Tin Pan Alley, seven of the most well-known composers who contributed to what we call the American Songbook. While there were many other composers that contributed to the American Songbook, it is beyond the scope of this class to cover all of them now. It suffices to say that the songs they composed were very popular when they were first published and continue to be so today. Jazz players of all generations never seem to run out of things to find in this musical treasury of Americana called Tin Pan Alley or the American Songbook. So how do jazz musicians find and learn tunes? Typically, jazz musicians learn tunes from sheet music, lead sheets, fake books, recordings, or gig experience. One way musicians find or learn tunes is by going to a music store to browse and purchase sheet music. Of course, today we can more easily browse and purchase sheet music on the internet by visiting websites such as sheetmusicdirect.com or sheetmusicplus.com. What's great about having the sheet music version of a tune is that it represents the original concept of the songwriter. Another way would be to learn the tune from a lead sheet. A lead sheet provides the musician with the melody, chord symbols, and sometimes the lyrics. This is a concise representation of the tune for the experienced musician who has the skills to look at it and turn it into music. What lead sheets lack often are the important details. A musician does a much better job with a lead sheet if he or she has already heard the tune. Fake books. A fake book is merely a collection of lead sheets bound together in a book. We call them fake books because they allow a musician to fake his or her way through a gig even if he or she doesn't know a lot of tunes. A jazz musician can also learn a tune by listening to a recording or multiple recordings to get an idea of the different interpretations that are out there. This is probably the most common way in which jazz musicians learn tunes. 
Often when musicians learn tunes this way, they remember them better. And finally, a jazz musician might learn a tune while on a playing job, or what we would call a gig. This happens all the time. There might be a lead sheet to help the musician, or the musician might simply be expected to pick up the tune by ear right there on the job. Thelonious Monk insisted that his band members learn his tunes this way, and many of those musicians that worked with him later said that the tunes that Monk taught them on the bandstand stayed with them for life. Ethnomusicologist Paul Berliner interviewed a long list of musicians for his monumental study of the jazz tradition in a book called Thinking in Jazz. One idea that surfaced with some frequency is that jazz musicians often refer to tunes as vehicles, meaning that tunes are creative vehicles for the jazz performer. Also interesting about the use of this term is that the word vehicle implies movement, an important element in music. So if a tune is a creative vehicle for a jazz musician, what framework does a tune provide? Well, the most distinguishing element of a tune is its melody. And every melody has a harmonization associated with it, which we call the chord progression. Also important is the harmonic and rhythmic structure of a tune that musicians call the form. Form refers to a tune's internal structure, meaning the number of measures or bars, and the repeated and contrasting sections in the design of the composition. Common jazz forms include the 12-bar blues and 32-bar song forms such as AABA and ABAC. Lee Konitz is a saxophonist who is probably best known for his work with pianist Lenny Tristano in the 1950s. When Paul Berliner interviewed him, Konitz identified four levels of improvisation. They are interpretation, embellishment, variation, and radical variation, or improvisation. Interpretation in the context of music or drama is the way in which a play or piece of music is performed so as to convey a particular understanding of the work. When interpreting a majority of music in the Western classical tradition, this means observing without fail everything in the score. The only elements that are open to interpretation typically are tempo and dynamics. Dynamics is just another word for volume. Lee Konitz's definition of interpretation factors in the creative freedom that jazz musicians have. A jazz musician has a lot more options available when it comes to interpretation. One of those options is tempo. For a given tune, a jazz musician may choose drastically different tempos depending on his or her personal preference on any given day. I may choose to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star slowly and methodically, or maybe I'll play it quickly. Harmony. Jazz musicians often have their own versions of the harmony for a tune. My harmonization for Twinkle Twinkle Little Star in this example should sound quite different from what most people would consider to be the original harmonization. Some tunes are adaptable to different meters. 
Playing a tune that is normally in 4-4 in 3-4 becomes an interpretive decision for a jazz musician. Here is an example of our tune in 3-4. And how about a version in 5-4? Groove. By groove, we mean the dance beat. A jazz musician may choose to set a tune to any groove in order to suit the occasion. For example, what would Twinkle Twinkle Little Star sound like as a Brazilian bossa nova? Perhaps the occasion calls for a version of our tune with a swinging stride piano groove. Lee Konitz then moves on to embellishment. Embellishment is frowned upon in the Western classical tradition, yet encouraged in jazz. To embellish is to add something to what is already there. Very simply, this means adding notes to the melody of the tune, or possibly adding decorative fills between phrases. Pianist Art Tatum was a master at this as he danced around melodies in an astonishing fashion. As elaborate and virtuosic as his style is, most of Tatum's recorded work can be characterized as embellishment because the melody is usually embedded in everything you hear him play. Now let's see and hear an embellished version of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Next is variation. Lee Konitz's definition is a bit subjective. You know it when you hear it. Let's just say that variation includes altering the melodic components, pitch and duration, and possibly the harmonic components to the point where what you end up with is noticeably different but still resembles or is comparable to the original. A few of the strategies we have to provide variation are displacement. To displace a melody is to move it forward or backward in time from its original temporal placement. Thelonious Monk loved this device. We can also use repetition. By repeating notes or groups of notes, we can add a significant amount of variation, yet you still hear the melody there. A 
Another strategy is to paraphrase the melody. Louis Armstrong was especially good at this as he was at so many things. Listen to his version of Stardust to appreciate his ability to paraphrase. What might it sound like to paraphrase Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? Well, we could spend endless time on the topic of variation, but we need to move on. The last level of improvisation that Lee Konitz refers to is called radical variation. This is where a musician invents new melodies that bear little, if any, resemblance to the existing melody of the tune. When this is happening, a musician is substituting a new melody in place of the original melody while adhering to the chord progression. Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, and many other of their contemporaries developed this approach to such a degree that they created their own musical language. We call it bebop. Now listen to one last version of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star that explores all four of the levels of improvisation described by Lee Konitz. Mm -hmm. 